Because man has a basic affection or desire or weakness to admire man. You can be sure that if someone sets them up and says, I'm a leader, I'm somebody, they're going to get someone to follow them. Now, our case in point is if you look around the United States and throughout the world, have you noticed the many halls of fame? The Baseball Hall of Fame, Football Hall of Fame, the Race Car Hall of Fame, the Fishing Hall of Fame. It's because man has a basic affinity to admire others. That's why movie stars, those in the entertainment field, the athletes, that's why they're paid such handsome salaries to endorse products. Because the advertising field knows the basic weakness. Of man. According to one survey, the new Psychology Today research, here's what it suggests, and this is why it's so important for you and I as Christians. It suggests that the worship of celebrities by the public has begun to take a place of religion in people's lives. Writing in the Sunday London Times, the doctor said, the weaker a person's religious convictions, the more likely he is to worship celebrities. Note what he said. This form of worship is demonstrated by those who are willing to pay high prices to collect items owned by those touched by celebrities. Additionally, celebrity worshipers will pattern their values, their lifestyle, on those of their favorite idol, who is often perceived by them as incapable of wrongdoing, and they're operating under a different set of rules. The impact that celebrities have on others is also evident in the results of product endorsements, the same research says, and in mimicking their lifestyle, even when it comes to healthcare decisions. And he adds, this suggests that our worship of celebrities does indeed turn them into the most powerful people on the planet, the equivalent of gods in our midst. Do you know that there are still Elvis Presley sightings today? You know, it's very easy for a young man to go out and buy a pair of speakers because someone else has endorsed them. 
In fact, if Oprah said it, many are inclined to go along with it. Recently, Marilyn Monroe belongings were just auctioned off. A pair of blue jeans. They were basic pair of thrift store blue jeans. Someone paid $42,550. How many you'll think about it? See, man has this basic desire of affinity to admire others. A cookbook that Marilyn Monroe used, we're not sure whether she could cook at all or not. But a cookbook that was hers, endorsed by her, it sold for $29,900. And that dress that she wore when she sang the famous song, Happy Birthday, Mr. President, that dress sold for $1,267,500. Yes, man has the basic affinity for admiring man. Now, since the devil knows this, and that's why his aim in misleading mankind, he realized that he does not have to mislead each and every individual here in the audience. Satan knows that. Really, it's like cowboys that herd cattle. They're not interested in misleading or hurting all of the cattle. What they focus on are the lead steers. Once they get the lead steers running in a certain direction, all the other cattle, they raise their head and they start running right behind them. And so Satan knows that I don't have to mislead everybody. I mislead the beautiful people, the famous people, the stars. Once I get them misled, the rest of mankind will follow. And before you know it, if a person shows a certain amount of uh, charisma, personality, or aptitude, it's very easy for them to create a problem. Now, if we analyze history, the results of this weakness of man have been tragic at times. Remember Hitler and his Nazi party. Remember Jim Jones down in Jonestown, Guyana in the late 70s. Many were misled. Do you know why the results uh, have been so tragic when it comes to man following man? Do you know why it's so important for all of us here to examine this question? Are we a disciple of Christ? Well, it's because, whether you know it or not, somebody is trying to make a disciple out of you. You may not even realize it. But due to this weakness or this tendency that we have of men, we might be inclined to follow someone else under the guise of following Christ. Now, here's why it's important for us to examine this. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 15. Here in Matthew, chapter 15, this helps us to appreciate the seriousness of all of this. Matthew, chapter 15, we'd like to draw your attention to verse 13. Now, these are the words of the Master, Jesus Christ. Now, note what he said. In reply, he said, Every plant that my heavenly Father did not plant will be uprooted. Now, here's why it's so important to make sure that we're a disciple of Christ. Because Jesus said, If my Father didn't plant it, it's not going to amount to anything. It's going to be uprooted. Now, how do we know he was talking about leadership? But well, look at the next verse. Let them be. Blind guides is what they are. If then a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. So Jesus tells us, now we are following someone. We are going to be guided by someone. But if you're being guided by someone that Jehovah God did not designate, that Jehovah didn't plant, it's going to be uprooted. 
It would be likened to one blind man following another blind man. Jesus said the results, yes, it will be disastrous. Now when Jesus was on the earth, before and after him, there was always this problem of man following man. The Apostle Paul quoted in Acts chapter 5, he said, well, remember the man Thutis. He thought he was somebody, and many followed him, and it came to be nothing. Prior to him, someone followed someone else. Many started to follow him, and they came to be nothing. Likewise, in this time period in which we lived in, Jesus specifically warned his followers, be careful. Somebody is trying to make a disciple out of you. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, and uh, let's consider the reasoning on this. In Matthew chapter 24, we'll note again the words of Jesus as he talks to his followers, and this information is applicable for you and I today. In Matthew chapter 24, Again, Jesus is giving him an answer, but this time, note the clear answer he gives in verse 4 and 5. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 4, an answer Jesus said to them, Look out that nobody misleads you. For many will come on the basis of my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. Now these warnings are clear. Jesus said, Look out that nobody misleads you. And by the way, nobody, it means nobody. It could be a religious figure. It could be a political figure. It could be someone who lives down the street from you, maybe in the same building. It could be somebody in your congregation. Somebody on your job. Yes, it could be somebody in school. Jesus said, look out that nobody mislead you, because Jesus knew how easy it would be for humans to have the tendency to follow another woman. So you're involved in the question, are you a disciple of Christ? And how do you know? How would you answer that question? Well, it's not enough just to raise your hand and say, well, I'm a disciple of Christ. That's not how you answer the question. In fact, really, the way to answer the question is based on the definition of a disciple. In Matthew chapter 23, uh, let's turn there. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 10. This tells us why... We want to be a disciple of Christ, first of all. Matthew 23 and verse 10. Neither be called leaders, for your leader is one, the Christ. Now, how many in our audience have ever played the game, follow the leader? Anybody ever played that game? Just raise your hand. All right, that's the vast majority of We've all played that game. And it was an interesting game, wasn't it? Until you realized that you could be out very easily. <laughs> In fact, if you weren't really paying attention, at first it was fun, just zigzagging the side to side, but someone could quickly do something, and before you know it, they say, you're out, you're out of line, you're, you're out of bounds. Well, that's the way it is with following our leader, Christ. It takes concentration. It takes purposeful effort. It's not something that we do automatically, because remember, the tendency is follow man to follow another human. So again, have you chosen Christ as your leader? The Bible says that for Christians, their leader is one. And that's the Christ. How do we answer that question? Well, let's just explore the definition of a disciple. Now it's true, the basic understanding of the word disciple it means a learner. It means a taught one. It means someone that is disciplined because that's a 
form of the word, the root for discipline, is disciple. So it means someone is disciplined in the teachings of another. They were learning. They were talking. But it involves more than that. Really, if you are a disciple, that means you adhere to what the other person adheres to. You are a supporter of the other person. In fact, you begin to imitate that one. So the way to answer the question is not just to raise our hand and say, yes, well, I'm a disciple of Christ. Well, the way the question is answered is, who are you supporting? Who are you imitating? Who are you adhering to? That's how we give the answer. Now, Jesus mentioned some very important requirements, obviously, when it came to following him. He said, number one, we must strive to remain in his word. Number two, he said we, we should have love among ourselves. Those are basic requirements. Number three, we should keep bearing fruit. The fruit of the kingdom. But you know, when we played the game Follow the Leader, there was a lot more involved than just basically realizing you were supposed to be following someone. There were details involved. Now, if Jesus and his 12 apostles, if they ever played follow the leader, literally the game, follow the leader, who would you say probably always got out of line? Of the 12, who would you say, oh, I know he was out of line? Who would you say? Now, how many of you are saying Peter? Yes. Peter makes us feel good because we say, well, see, Peter messed up. And he's he's kind of like me. But probably Peter was always getting out of line. You know, it's interesting. That when Peter gave details about following the model, Peter focused on something that we usually miss. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Now here in the Bible, we get part of our thrust of our discussion. 1 Peter chapter 2, if you'll notice verse 21. Now Peter, this was a general letter. He had spoken to them about severe trials, the need for encouragement, and telling them not to be misled. But in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, look what the Bible says. Now Peter tells us, In fact, to this course you were called, because even Christ suffered for you, leaving you a model for you to follow his steps closely. Do you know that suffering is inherent for anyone that wants to follow Christ? If you are going to be a disciple of Christ, you must be willing to suffer. In fact, if you're not willing to suffer, you're going to sin. If you're not willing to suffer, you will not be able to follow the Christ. Because suffering and trouble, why well, that's a lot in our lives, as Christians. Now here's what happens. Because of the environment that we're in, the circumstances that we all face and our own weaknesses, this old world that surrounds us tries to squeeze us into its mold. And you know, if we're not careful, before long, because suffering is involved with being a Christian, we always look for opportunities to be just like the world. Now, note some letters that come into the branch office. Probably won't believe it, but note some letters. I want to know right now, can a brother be a ministerial servant and have cornrows? Now, where is that coming from? Automatically. They're no longer focusing on the crops. It's the world around them. Now, I realize I'm in Philadelphia, so I'm an AI country. But where does that come from? It's probably someone prominent, perhaps a star, an entertainer, an athlete, and now all of a sudden someone who knows that they're supposed to be following the Christ, now all of a sudden they become sidetracked. One letter came in, can we have permanent tattoos? Body piercing. Why can't we wear pantsuits to the meetings? 
and many, many more. Some are too shameful even to relate. We have brothers and sisters that are actually writing the branch and asking questions, but it betrays that the world, they don't want to suffer. They don't want to be viewed as different. They want to be viewed as standing out as different. See, if we're not careful, somebody is trying to make a disciple out of you. Whether you realize it or not, whether they realize it or not, maybe by personality, charisma, maybe knowledge, natural gifts or abilities, we begin to come aside with that one. Or we want to kind of do what they do. We give them their own rules and their own standards. How terrible and how bad some felt when they realized that a popular sports star had been unfaithful to his wife. He was there, he been. Now it's all coming out in the watch. He's an adulteress just like everybody else. But that was their evil. If he did it, they did it. Now we may chide some and say, well, it's ridiculous to have Elvis sightings today. The man's been dead for years. Marilyn Monroe, why she, she died back in the 60s. That, that's a shame. But what would you do if a popular entertainer said, do you want my job? Now, a pair of sneakers you can have, what would you do? And yet Jesus said, now Christ left the mom. We have to do with the model. That's the model. That's the standard. We're playing follow the leader. We don't want to get out of line. We stay in line and follow the Christ. So ultimately, we have to have in our mind that suffering is involved with the Christian. Now, what do we mean suffering? Well, we don't mean uh, the type of suffering that one may do in a torture training room. They're trying to get some information out of someone. We're not referring to that type of suffering. We're referring to the type of suffering of just this discomfort. You know how you feel when someone slams the door in your face when you're out in the ministry? Of course, you were called. We can't get away from it. The rules are we have to go according to this course. What's inherent with this course? Yes, we'll say again. It's suffering. There's things we're going to have to endure. Christ is the model. Now this willingness to endure suffering is very important to be a disciple of Christ. Many want to be popular. They want to be well thought of. They want the plaudits and the praises of men. And isn't it so difficult when we're younger to put up with that? So we compromise sometimes. We came in. You see, we don't want to suffer. Maybe at work, people tell off-colored stories and jokes. And we don't want to suffer. It's being different. So, we don't necessarily stand up. We compromise sometimes. We try to laugh so that they don't leave us alone. Well, if we're a disciple of Christ, it should be clear in our mind that there's a course we've been called to. And that course is, in order to endure, suffering will be involved. Here in these last days, in this time of the end, that's how you answer the question. It'd be easy just to raise your hand and say, well, I'm a disciple of Christ. No, the way we know you're a disciple of Christ is if you imitate him. If you support him. If you adhere to what he adhered to and to all of his teachings. Let's look at a few specific areas, though. We talked a little bit in generalities. The keynote for being a disciple of Christ, yes, is showing love, staying in God's word, certainly <laughs> spreading kingdom seed, no doubt about it. There are other things that are involved with being a disciple of Christ. Foremost in that is bearing up on the persecution or suffering. Well, let's look at some specific ways in which we may be called on to suffer, because we've been using that word quite a bit. But let's look at some specific areas in the life of a Christian 
especially here in these last days, that we may be called on to follow the model closely. The way follow the leader is so that we must keep our eyes on the national. We're going to go back to what Peter said. It's interesting that Peter was the one that commented on this. Because many times throughout his life, what did Peter do? Peter got out of line. Peter got out of line. When he finally caught on, late in his life, it's interesting that he wrote this letter telling us, Christ is the Bible. If you're going to answer the question, you're a disciple of Christ, Peter says, yes, let's follow the Bible. Let's go back to 1 Peter. Uh, this time in 1 Peter chapter 2, here's a specific area that we're going to focus on. Let's look at your secular work. The work that you do in a secular way. Now as Christians we know that our main work is to preach and to teach the good news of the kingdom. That's part of that spreading the kingdom seed. That's part of remaining in God's word. Yes, that's part of the work that we do to bear fruit. But how many of us work secular? How many of us have ever worked secular? And so now we're, we're all involved. We're all involved in this. We've said it's not enough for you to sit here and just say, well, I'm a disciple of Christ. How can you get proof on your job where you work secularly that you are a disciple of Christ? Or has somebody made a disciple out of you? Are you following the model at work? Now note what Peter said. In 1 Peter chapter 2, starting with verse 18. Now Peter said, Let house servants be in subjection to their owners with all due fear, not only to the good and reasonable, but also to those hard to please. For if someone, because conscience toward God, bears up under grievous things and suffers unjustly, this is an agreeable thing. Now we know the context that he's referring to. Now right away some might say, well now that doesn't apply to me because I'm not a house servant. We have overcome. <laughs> Not really. You see, in, in scriptural principle, just in principle, if you are employed, you are like a house servant. In principle, you're under servitude. You've agreed, you've signed some type of application, you went on agreement, you're in Bible principle, you would be likened to a house servant. You're under a form of servitude. Now, whether or not your boss or your supervisor is hard to please or not, are you a disciple of Christ at work? We're other servants. The Bible principle here is a house servant. He says we do fear not only the good and reasonable, but also those that are hard to please according to verse 18. In the scriptural setting, this applies if you are an employee. To your owner or to your employer, do you show respect? Now, not just passing respect, but at your place of employment, are you known as a respectful person? Or has somebody else made a disciple out of you? You see, the model was to bear up even under those that are hard to please. See how easy it is we can get out of line? We're supposed to be playing follow the lead. Before you know it, some are going to try to find the NAACP. <laughs> they forgot the leader. Our leader is one, and that's the cross. So in these last days, in these very difficult and delicate situations, we can get on a line without even thinking about it. That's why it takes purposeful effort to be a disciple of Christ. We don't do it accidentally. Here's some questions. 
Do we show respect and work conscientiously? Does anything change because we're no longer in a theocratic setting? Do you do an honest day's work? Quality work? Do you work the agreed number of hours? According to one survey, those that survey, 60% of those that survey say that they sleep at some time on their job. 60% of those surveyed. We're not going to ask you to raise your hand and hurt yourself and see what you would say. <laughs> but we're just examining the question, are you a disciple of Christ? At work, are you willing to stand up under abusive speech? Even if you're not taught well enough, do you stand up under it? Now, some say, well, no, I don't have to do that. I don't have to take that. And I'll quit. Well, not everybody can quit. See, they're, they're under a servitude. And so what will they do if they decide to remain on the job in principle as a house servant? Even if suffering is involved, yes, those that are hard to do. Just in principle, what do we do? Let's just focus on another area. How about in school? For the young ones here in our midst. Really, you know, in school, it's the same type of servitude. Your parents have enrolled you. You'd be viewed as a truant if you didn't attend school. You go under that type of servitude, and now, as young people, can you bear up in this set, or do you give in? Not enough to say, well, I can talk to the credit school, and I go out of service. You know, if we're not careful, young people really live double lives, and sometimes we encourage them. I remember one brother came back from a district convention and he made this observation. One of the older members of the Bethel family. He said, you know you're at the district convention and you're staying at the hotel and you see all these young people walk in the hotel after the program and they have on their suits and ties and their dresses. And then when they change clothes, you see these same young people walking out of the hotel and they don't look anything like Christians. What does that tell us? Sometimes it's even being allowed and encouraged at home. You know, unfortunately, sometimes, if you can believe this, unfortunately, some young brothers, they get involved with listening to the wrong type of music or entertainment there at Bethel. And after counsel and trying to work with them, would you believe that some get sent home because of the type of music you listen to? And horror of horrors. You know what some of the brothers say? I used to listen to this at home. See, we encourage it sometimes. They don't want to suffer. They don't want to be looked down upon at school or in the neighborhood by their cousins, their brothers, or their sisters. The way we answer the question is we follow the example of Christ. Now, here's what one witness you've said. One witness you've said being different is the hardest part of being a Christian. How many young ones would agree? They said, just being different in school is the hardest part of being a Christian. Another said, the kids look down on me. I've been called a wimp, a nerd, and everything else because I don't go along. Sometimes a curiosity. One young brother at Bethel said, that wasn't so much that I wanted a girl. I wanted to know just could I get a girl. <laughs> you know, I just want to know, can I get a girlfriend? I know we're not supposed to. But the curiosity is there. And it's hard to bear up. You know being different, which may be the hardest part of being a Christian as a young person. Well, take courage. It's hard for all of us. But you know what being different has always characterized being a servant of Jehovah. You're not the only one that's being asked to be different. Being different has always characterized servants of Jehovah. Now imagine this. Imagine being told that you had to wear a beard, you had to wear a type of garment that no one else wore, and you had to put blue strings and little uh, 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 barbells at the bottom of your garment, and you had to walk around in front of everybody with that on. No other nation, no one else wears it. But that's what the nation of Israel had to do. 
Now some say it's hard to be different. Jehovah says you must be different. These last days, the young ones say, well, it's hard to be holy. God says you must be holy because I am holy. And so the principle is to serve God, you're called on to be young. We might as well get used to it when we're young because if you plan to serve God, you will always have to stand out as being different. He specifically cited his servants to do that. Look at uh, Numbers chapter 15. We invite all to turn there, in particular, our young ones here with us. As we examine this question, are you a disciple of Christ? In Numbers chapter 15, let's look together at verse 38. Numbers chapter 15 and verse 38. Know what the Bible says. Speak to the sons of Israel, and you must say to them that they must make for themselves print edges upon the skirts of their garments throughout their generations. And they must put a blue string above the fringe edge of the skirt. That was a peculiar form of dress. No one else dressed like that. Jehovah says, you tell all of your servants, you tell all of your family, throughout all the generations, this is what they're going to wear. Jehovah says, I want them to be there. Jehovah wanted them to be different. He backed them, gave them a code of law, and gave them the Mosaic law that kept them different from all other nations. Jehovah has always been interested in his servants being different from all of them. Now, once you know that because you're being different and you're pleasing Almighty God Jehovah, perhaps we clear up a little bit. Job was always demanding. He's not just demanding it out of you in this 20th century. And yet many of our young ones will admit, and we can recognize, being different is one of the hardest things to do. Well, unlike the Jewish arrangement, Christianity allows for freedom. It allows for individuality. It allows for us to express ourselves in various forms. We're not on a dress code or a code of law. But does that mean we jump on every fashion bandwagon that there is? You know, the faithful slave once said that you don't necessarily want to be the first to wear something, but you don't want to be the last one either. Which means that you don't want to stand out uh, either way. Either mocking the world or being so strange so peculiar in this time period in which we live in, that's why Jehovah allows for freedom of expression. So actually, as Christians, we have it far better than the nation of Israel. He allows us to express ourselves. But yet there may be times when suffering is involved. How about the music that we listen to? Music can stir up emotions and passions, and much of today's music is simply unfit for Christian music, if we really stop and think about it. How about the movies that we watch? You know, years ago, it was very difficult for a young man and a young woman to see a movie that was bad because you just couldn't get into the movie theater if you were underage. But what is Satan done? He's made it so easy to bring these things right into the privacy of your own home. And if you're not careful, somebody is going to make a disciple out of you. You're no longer really following Christ in some of these particular areas. Here's what young person, one young person said. He said, for me, holidays are the hardest. All the kids asked, why are you celebrating? For one teenage girl, she said the toughest issue is whether to go out with God. Yet another Christian teenager complains, for me it's the pressure to socialize. Everybody wants to know, aren't you going to the party? To the game? Or to the prom? Now the question is put before us. Are you a disciple of Christ? Remember, the Bible says, if you're not willing to suffer, 
that we're probably going to say. So when it comes to our younger brothers and sisters, our appeal is just is just to think about it. Give it some thought. It takes concentration, it takes effort to make disciples. We don't just haphazardly follow Jesus because it's natural weakness that we have as man. If we're really not paying attention, we'll start to follow somebody else. That's the way we're made. Let's look at another area, the third area. How about in the home, in the house in which you live? Is it evident? as a husband or as a wife that you are a disciple of Christ? Can people see that in your pattern? Well, Peter was, he was married. He was one of the twelve that was married. And Peter obviously gave some good counsel when it comes to the husband and the wife. Let's go back to First Peter. And in some of the counsel that Peter gave in 1 Peter chapter 3 this time, Peter uses a phrase that really takes us back to the model. He points us back to the Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1, Peter said, In like manner. Well, in what manner? Remember in this context, he was talking about the Christ. So right away, Peter says, this counsel that I'm going to give, it's in like manner. You should do it just like the Christ did. That's what Peter is saying. Well, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1, he said, in like manner, you wives be in subjection to your own husband, in order that if any are not obedient to the word, they may be won without a word through the conduct of their wives. So her conduct should be in like manner to Christ's conduct. Her conduct should be in such a way that whether in regard it involves suffering or not, the wife would comport herself in like manner. Now in your home, first let's talk about if your husband's an unbeliever, not if he's acting like an unbeliever, but if he's an unbeliever. <laughs> will know what the Bible says. Based on the way she acts, he may be one without a word. In like manner, if she follows the model. So who would a wife want to look at? She would want to look at the Christ. We would say, you don't have to look anywhere else. You don't have to read all of these books or anything like that. If you look at the model, you do what the model did. In like manner, you will be successful. That's what Peter is telling us in 1 Peter chapter 3. Now look at verse 3 and 4. He said, And do not let your adornment be that of the external braiding of the hair, and the putting on of gold ornaments, or the wearing of outer garments. But let it be the secret person of the heart, in the incorruptible apparel of the quiet and mild spirit, which is of great value in the eyes of God, so now Peter says the Christian woman, the woman that is a disciple of Christ, yes, yeah, she would be concerned with how she looks. She be con would be concerned with her dress and her grooming. But what would she put emphasis on? And what do we see today? What is it that people put emphasis on today? Is it the vast majority of mankind more concerned with their external features, their outer performance, as opposed to that secret person of the heart, the inner person? And if you're not careful, as a wife or as a Christian woman, somebody is going to make a disciple out of you. They will have your whole focus on your hair, your clothing, your cosmetics. Peter is helping us see that's that's not really in like manner of the Christ. He said, now, do you know what's really of great value in God's eyes? That Jesus knew? 
If you don't know it, that means you got out of line. You're no longer following the leader. He said, it's the secret person of the heart. It's the person you are on the inside. Now, the world is not going to give you that because they want your money. They want you to buy them. So they're going to have the beautiful people to take the lead. They want you to raise your hand and see them and start running after them. That's what Satan wants to do. But a disciple of Christ is always focusing on the inner person. The secret person of the heart. Because they know that's, that's how they answer the question. That's how they show who and what they're adhering to. Who they're imitating. Whose teachings they're following. And so here Peter said, in like manner, yes, the Christian woman would want to follow the example of Jesus Christ. Now he's not talking about a woman that has... Let's take a close look. He's not referring to a woman who can't think, has no initiative. He's not referring to someone who doesn't have a mind of her own. No, he's saying, like Christ, she's going to come into certain trying situations... Certain circumstances are going to cause her to suffer just a little bit. And what is she going to do? Is she going to be willing to suffer? Or is she going to stand? That's what he said. Now there is definitely suffering involved with a woman being in subjection to a man. Isn't that true? I know you don't want to say it. There is suffering involved with being in subjection to a man. Now what might concede, seem to be unfair about it is Peter said in like manner. But you know, we feel for Christian women. You know why? Because they have to be in subjection to imperfect men. Now it's true, Paul did say that I want you to know that the head of the Christ is God. Well, Jehovah's perfect. He said, I want you to know that the head of man is the Christ. Well, Christ is perfect. Then he said, the head of the woman is the man, the poor woman. There's going to be some suffering involved with that. Many times you know he does not know what he is doing. And you have to be in subjection to him. You're supposed to say in like manner. Well, just turn it around. Just turn it around. Christ allowed himself to be transferred from a highest position in heaven to the womb of an imperfect woman imperfect people and he was in subjection to his death. In like manner is what Peter is saying. If you're really going to be a spiritual woman and think like God, you'll follow the law. You'll follow Jesus. You'll follow his steps closely is what he said. See how easy it is for us to get sidetracked and turn around? Before you know it, you read a book. Then not be Ebony or Jet or anything like that. You just read a book. You, you heard a talk show. You got down to a size 6 or a size 8. You say, she must know what she's talking about. Before long, you'll see something on television. And now we're off. We're following that. That's what Satan wants. We're no longer concentrating on the Christ. Well, when distressing circumstances come up at home, here was a survey. This was to wives. They said, here's what wives should examine. Whenever you're faced with distressing circumstances at home, do you explode? Do you display rage and anger? Or do you have a calm and mild spirit? Interesting. A secular survey asked, do you have a calm and mild spirit? That's that secret person of the heart that the Bible talks about. Can you maintain control in your home under a trying situation? In like manner of the Christ? Or do you let everybody know you're upset, disappointed? Do you don't tell everybody about it? Do you wreak havoc in your home? The Bible asks us, 
to think about it. Have you become a disciple of someone else? Under the guise of being a Christian woman. Now there's something else that the Bible tells us for women. It tells a woman to respect her husband. You know there's a difference between respect and love? Did you know that? There is a difference between respect and love. Now it is true, they kind of work in tandem as a team. But do you know that you can have respect for someone but not love them? Isn't that true? You can respect someone but not love them. You know, actually, you can love someone but not respect them. You're so used to them. You've been around them for so long. You know he works hard. You can look at him and see how he's trying. I love him. But you know she won't respect him? That's why Paul told the Christian woman. See, he, he understood the same thing Peter understood. That's why Paul told the Christian woman to respect your husband. He never told the husband that. But he told the Christian woman to respect your husband. Because it's so easy. Oh, she'll love him. But it's so easy to lose that respect. That is really displayed in so many ways. Uh, that, that word respect, by the way, it, it is an interesting word as we just analyze it and look at ourselves and our service to Jehovah and following Christ. Because the, the word uh, spectacles comes from the same root. Spectacles, you know, the eyeglasses. And re just means to repeat, to do it over and over again. And really, if you are really respecting your husband, you're taking a double look. You know, when you did when you first saw him. You, you're taking a double look. It means you go back and look at him again. And you go back and you look at him again. And you go back and you look at him again. That's respect. So you're always going back and looking at him in the position that you're holding him. That's respect. And Jesus displayed respect even when he needed to be in subjection to imperfect, lowly, and puny so Peter said, in like man, if you're a disciple of Christ in, in your home, then respect your husband. And otherwise, if you're not careful, you see somebody's going to make a disciple out of you. And it would be very easy to be wrong. Let's talk to the husband just a little bit, else I want to get out of here. Let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, now, uh, brothers, the bulk of the counsel in the Bible, when it talks about the household, it comes on the husband. The husband carries the majority of the weight due to the headship present. So the bulk of the counsel, it comes to the husband. Now look what the Bible says. If we are going to be a disciple of Christ, verse 7, it says, You husbands, continue dwelling in like manner. There it is again. Well, in what manner? It's in manner of Christ. Christ is the model. If you're a Christian, you're going to go back and look at the Christ, not just when it comes to field service, not just when it comes to preaching and teaching, but no, in your home, look at the Christ. And see if you're following his example. Now look what he said in verse 7. You husbands, continue dwelling in like manner with them, according to knowledge, assigning them honor as a weaker vessel, the feminine one, since you are also heirs with them of the undeserved favor of life, in order for your prayers not to be hindered. So well, that's, that's some strong counsel. Right away there in verse 7, we can probably pick it out. It says, assigning them honor as to a weaker vessel. That just simply means, well, the wife could be likened to a weaker vessel. That means the husband's weak too. Is it a weaker? You're weak too. The only way you're going to make it has to be a like man of Christ. 
we can't make it without the following the example of the mind. Verse 7 says, according to knowledge. Well, according to what knowledge? You know, according to the context. Now, this is applied in principle in many ways, but according to the context of what Peter was referring to, it's not just knowledge of our wives as husbands. But right away, a brother would say, well, that's knowledge of my wife, right? I need to know how she is and her vicissitudes and her likes and dislikes and her weaknesses. Well, yes, that's true. But Peter is saying, you really want to dwell with her according to knowledge that if you don't treat her in like manner of the Christ, Jehovah will destroy you. According to that knowledge. In like manner. That's really what you want to have in mind. Well, with her according to that knowledge, that Jehovah is expecting you to dwell with your wife in a certain way. Well, now, right away, many men, Christian and otherwise, will quickly say, well, you know, God assigned me as the head. Well, God assigned man to be a hand, to be a loving hand. The way you learn that is by following the example of Christ. You're not automatically the head that Jehovah God had in mind. Well, how do you accomplish it? You have to follow the model. You have to follow Jesus. You dwell with your wife, with your family, the way that Jesus dwelt with his disciples. Now, the way we know that this is very interesting and applicable, Let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. Because here we see how the Bible uh, ties in together. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to hold your place there in Peter. But in Ephesians chapter 5. Notice what the Bible says. Start with verse 25. Very interesting. It says, Husbands, continue loving your wives. Just as the Christ also loved the congregation and delivered up himself for it. Well, let's stop there. Because we, some of us are awaiting the mark. We, so we missed something. And verse 25, he says, Husbands, continue loving your wife. Now, he said the wife should have deep respect for her husband. You never told the husband he told the husband to continue loving your wife. He never told the wife to continue loving your husband. Why? Because that tendency would be there. She may not respect him, but she'll love him. Now, it's the converse with the husband. See, Paul didn't invert the counsel. He gave one to one, one to the other. He told husbands, you're going to have to work at loving your wife. You see, that's why a man, he'll respect his wife. He'll look at her, the mother of my children, but he'll lose that love. He'll lose that love. That's why the Bible says, no, you continue to love your wife. Now, who leaves a home more? A woman or a man? Who walks out on the home more? The woman or the... It's right there in the Bible. You see, if you're not careful, Someone will make a disciple out of you. So the Bible says continue. That means as husbands, we're supposed to love and love and love and love our wives. That's the thought of this Greek word, continue loving your wife. You have to love her, husband. You have to love her. If you're really a disciple of Christ, there would be no doubt in your wife's mind that you love her. Now, here's why we say this. Look at the ensuing verses. Verse 25, yes, husbands should continue loving their wives. Just as the Christ also loved the congregation. They tie it in the congregation. Here's the like manner. Verse 26, now look what Christ did. That he might sanctify it, that is the congregation, cleansing it with the bath of water by means of the word, that he might present the congregation to himself in its splendor, 
not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now you have to understand the picture. What this is telling us is that when that bride of Christ, of course when all of them are in heaven, when that bride of Christ is presented there by Jesus to Jehovah, they're presented there without a spot, without a blemish, without a wrinkle. Christ loved them. He took such care of this anointed congregation that he can put them before Jehovah and say, Jehovah, here they are. You know I love them. They don't have a spot. They don't have a wrinkle. They don't have a blemish. Now in that manner, husbands are called on to continue to love them all. Does your wife feel that way? Can you see her walking down the street saying, you know, I'm just, I'm just loved by my husband. Regardless of what happens, she knows I'm just loved by my man. She's going to make sure I'm without spot, without blemish, without wrinkle. And I'll tell you now, before you get started, <laughs> As husbands, the fact that we're called on to do this has nothing to do with how our wife acts. We can't use that as an excuse. Well, if she's going to act like that, I'm going to act like this. That's not going to work. You have to be willing to suffer. The model, suffer. So now, if you're doing something good and you're being slapped, the Bible said that's an agreeable thing with God. If you bring her flowers and she slaps you and you endure it, that's an agreeable thing with God. Yes. Because Christ offered up this anointed body without any blemish, without a spot, without a wrinkle to Jehovah. And they weren't thinking about Jesus half the time. They weren't doing what they were supposed to do. They were arguing about who was the greatest. Other times they were arguing, bickering and fighting. They couldn't even stay up when Jesus said, just kind of stay up a little bit. I'm going to go over here and pray. So if your wife can't bear up to your expectations, if you're a little disappointed in her and her spirituality and things that she does, that has nothing to do with what you are supposed to do. You are claiming to be a disciple of Christ. Well, how do you prove it? Continue to love your wife. That's what the Bible tells us. That's the counsel for us as husbands. And remember now, if you're not willing to suffer, you're probably going to sin. Yes, like Christ, the husband, he's going to come under certain trying situations and circumstances. But what will he do? What response will he have? Let's ask ourselves as husbands. Do I deal with my wife in a kind and a loving way? Am I short-tempered with her? Do I get mad with her and scream and belittle her? It's important because remember the Bible says it's so important that your prayers will be in Because Jehovah wants us to pray. He wants us to draw close to him. But Jehovah said, well, before you get things a little distorted here, your relationship with me is based on your relationship with her. In fact, husbands, when we see your wife, we see you. We don't mean physically. When we see your wife, we see you. If your wife's moving around and down and sad and so forth, you put something before her nine times out of ten. When we see your wife, we see you. Now you go out and give talks and show off and all that you want to. You only want to go as far as your wife takes you. You see these Christian men with responsibilities and privileges and so forth, they're only going to go as far as their wife takes them. So a man that's a disciple of Christ will always keep his wife parallel with them. She's not parallel enough to go back and go back to the drawing board, but I have to bring you with me. Because nothing else is really going to last. Remember the Bible says the two have become one. That's one flesh. One flesh. When we look at one flesh, we see one person. When we see your wife, we see you. When we see you, we see the wife. 
until it becomes one. In like manner, in our home, we dwell with our mates and our children the way Christ would. For any of you here now who are not disciples of Christ, well, how do you become a disciple of Christ? Well, one is doing just what you're doing now. You're coming in, taking in Bible-based knowledge. You're looking at the Word of God, not on the surface, but we're going beneath the surface to get a basic understanding of God's requirements. Baptism is what saves you. You're not a disciple of Christ unless you symbolize the dedication that you pay. You're still blood given. The waters of baptism put you in line to be a disciple of Christ. So continue to take in knowledge. Continue to do all that you can. And look for opportunities to make a change, not in an outward way, but inward. A change in Look what Romans says in the book of Romans chapter 12. Let's all turn there uh, together. And, uh, the Bible book of Romans chapter 12. Here's, here's an interesting statement that is made. And uh, all of us would do well to manage. In Romans chapter 12, look at verse 2. Interesting thought here. The Bible says, And quit being fashion." after this system of things, but be transformed. Now that's the key word. It says, by making your mind open, that you may prove to yourselves the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Verse 2 uses the word fashion. You know, when you change to the latest fashion, you haven't really changed anything inside yourself, have you? Uh, maybe outwardly, clothing, cosmetics. Uh, you can change to the latest fashion. But Paul said in verse 2, but be transformed. That's a key. A transformation means an inward change. He said you have to change from within. It's not what you put on the outward. But it's the person from within. The Greek word metamorphi, metamorphosis. You see a butterfly and a caterpillar, they're not the same thing. It's been a complete change. If we're going to be disciples of Christ, we do not automatically think like God when we come out of the womb. We do not automatically think like Jehovah based on the neighborhood we grew up in, or the people we're around, or those that we admire. No, the Bible says it has to be a transformation, a complete change from within. Well, how do we do that? How we follow the example of Christ. Anything that hasn't been planted by Jehovah, Jehovah said it's going to be uprooted. If we have a tendency to follow man, it says a blind man will lead a blind man into a pit. Our leader is one. And that's to Christ. If you haven't chosen him as your leader, choose him now. That's the only way to everlasting life. And remember, the way to answer the question that you're a disciple of Christ is by the things you adhere to. By following him. By being disciplined in his teaching. And remember here in these last days, if we don't concentrate if we don't focus on our relationship with Jehovah and follow Christ's steps closely, someone else is going to make a disciple out of you. Dear brothers, we would like to have your attention for a moment. As you know, we have invited for a special meeting and it's our pleasure to welcome Brother Lersch with us. He's going to address the audience. And maybe for some of those who do not know Brother Lersch um, so well, he uh, originally is from Austria and uh, he's in the truth for 50 years. 
He serves in New York and uh, since 1994 is a member of the governing body. Now we'd like to listen to Brother Lush, please. Thank you for the welcome. The teaching committee asked me to briefly address you at this noon time, and it's a great pleasure for me to do so. Well, this uh, convention program has been arranged, in a sense, by the faithful and discreet slave class. And I thought um, to discuss with you briefly some of the points that Jesus made about the faithful slave. If you turn to Matthew chapter 24, and most of you know these uh, verses by heart even, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. It says, Who really is the faithful and discreet slave whom his master appointed over his domestics to give them their food at the proper time? Happy is that slave if his master on arriving finds him doing so. Truly I say to you, he will appoint him over all his belongings. So who really is the slave? Well, in the past, sometimes there were different viewpoints. There was even a time when it was thought that Brother Russell, as a single person, was the slave. Of course, we now know that the faithful slave is made up by the anointed Christians that have lived at any given time since Pentecost 33 of our common era. Now, when it says here he is appointed over his domestics. Who are the domestics? True or false? The domestics are the great crowd. False, yes, because this applies even in the first century and because the appointment, the first appointment was at Pentecost 33. And in the first century there was nobody of the great crowd or those with earthly hope in the Christian congregations. So, therefore, it is understood that domestics are the individual anointed ones, whereas the slave is the, are the anointed ones as a collective body. So we know who is um, the slave, who are the domestics, and when the first appointment was made. Now, did you know that about <coughs> 72,000 sisters belong to the faithful slave? Did you ever think about that? Why? How? Well, we said the slave is all the anointed, and half of the anointed are sisters. And when I said 72,000, that's half of 144,000. But I don't mean exactly 72,000, because we don't know. Probably even a little bit more. Uh, sisters, because usually there are more sisters in the truth than brothers. So there's many sisters, half, about half, uh, that are part of the faithful slave. Now how could they give food to the domestics if they are not involved in writing articles that are published? Well, <clears throat> writing articles is not the only way to give out spiritual food, but it is also by preaching and teaching. For instance, when I got the truth in 1958, there were two sisters that were anointed that studied with me. Uh, so I became a domestic as, as an individual. And they were members of the faithful slave class. And so they gave out spiritual food to me. Sisters can also give out spiritual food. It's not only writing articles that the food is being served. Then it says that happy is the slave if his master, Jesus, on arriving, that takes us to our time, finds him doing so. Truly I say to you, he will appoint him over all his belongings. Did you notice? There's two appointments. The first appointment was at Pentecost 33. And then in verse 47, another appointment is mentioned. That would be when Jesus would uh, return or arrive. So when was that? Well, it uh, appears that this was around 1919. And at that time, the faithful slave class was uh, appointed over all the belongings. 
Now we said the slave is the anointed as a class, the domestics as individuals. Did Jesus forget to mention in this parable the great crowd of other sheep? Did he? Well, of course not. He, he mentioned the great crowd in this parable also, but how? Well, the watchtower repeatedly brought out that the great crowd is part of the belongings. Part of the belongings. It's not only the material um, possessions uh, that are at the disposal of uh, the faithful slave class, but uh, also the great crowd belongs uh, to Jesus and all other kingdom interests, of course. So besides providing spiritual food, what else does the faithful slave care for? In Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, we find an indication. It says there, Revelation 12, 17, And the dragon grew wrathful at the woman and went off to wage war with the remaining ones of her seed. The remaining ones. That's where we take the expression, the remnant, yeah? or from the remaining ones of her seed, that is the figurative seed of the heavenly woman, and Satan fights the woman and the remaining ones, the remnant. And <clears throat> what do they do? It says, who observe the commandments of God, and then follows an interesting expression. It says, and they have the work of bearing witness to Jesus. It says, they have the work. What does this mean? Well, it means that they are in charge of the work of bearing witness to Jesus. And that's why the governing body members are taken only from the remaining ones. Because uh, they are the ones that have the work. And they are the ones that are appointed over the belongings. And you cannot make uh, the belongings equal in authority if the ones are appointed over the others. That's the reason why so far uh, none of the great crowd members have been appointed to the governing body. Now the governing body represents the faithful slave. But faithful slave refers to all 144,000. Governing body members at this moment there are nine altogether. And I thought that perhaps you want to know a little bit more about the governing body members, perhaps a few more details. First of all, we have to emphasize that it's not an American body, but it's international, and for, especially it's something scriptural. And the members of the governing body come from different ethnic backgrounds and different countries. The oldest member, Brother John Barr, is from Scotland and he's uh, right now about 94 years old so we are very happy that he is still able to contribute a lot to the meetings at the governing body level brother John Barr well on the other side the youngest member is Jeffrey uh, Jackson who comes from Australia not Austria Australia yeah. And he used to serve as a missionary in different uh, Pacific uh, areas, including as a branch committee member and missionary in, in the Fiji Islands and also Samoa. And uh, then the second oldest brother, Ted Jerris, wanted to be here at this convention, but he was not able to come at this point. But he is 83 years old. And he is of Polish descent, and he still speaks some Polish. And then we have other brothers from the governing body, like, for instance, Brother Morris, who has raised two sons. One of them serves in Bethel with him, and another one is pioneering outside of Bethel. So we have a brother here with family experience. But we have also Brother Pierce on the governing body. Uh, he has raised five sons that at this time are all in the truth with their families. 
They are another brother with family experience. Brother Pierce also has some American Indian blood in himself. So, you see, we come from different ethnic uh, backgrounds. Well, we have also Brother Sam Hurd, who is the only uh, black brother on the governing body. He is from the United States. And then there is a certain brother, Gerrit Lösch, who is uh, from not Australia, but Austria. No kangaroos in Austria, please. Yeah. So again, a different country. And David Splain on the governing body is from Canada. And he learned French in Canada. And later was, after going through Gilead, he was assigned to Senegal in West Africa to serve as a missionary there. Um, and uh, now he's on the governing body. And we have uh, Steve Lett, one of the younger members who used to be also circuit overseer in the United States, and perhaps a number, quite a number of you may know him personally. So we are very happy to have this diversity. And if you ever are able to visit us at headquarters, please, um, you can uh, try to get in touch with us and visit. If we are there, we'll be happy to uh, converse with you briefly. I can imagine that some of you may have other questions, but I wouldn't be able to hear you from this distance, so you have to ask the questions when you come and visit headquarters. Well, it was a great privilege for me to be here with you for a few moments, and I'd like to conclude with the thought that really, you do not belong to the governing body. The governing body belongs to you, because we are here as servants to serve the worldwide brotherhood and the one that's the number one on the governing body what do you think who is that who is the number one on the governing body well there is no number one because we are all serving on on equal ta terms as as equals and who is the number one really it's jesus christ he is the head of the congregation and uh, so we are looking to him as a leader. He is our leader, not a human. We are not following a human, but Jesus, our Lord. And to emphasize that really Jesus is the number one and all on the governing body serve as equals, when the governing body was formed the way it is organized uh, today in the 1970s, the first start, uh, was in 1971 when it was understood that the directors of the corporation of the society that's not the same as the governing body it's different one is a legal tool and the governing body is the spiritual uh, body that makes the decisions the society doesn't make the decisions and so when the governing body was uh, formed in 1971 they started the rotation of the chairmanship. Since that year, since 1971, when the chairmanship was first uh, moved from Brother Noor to Brother Franz, but ever after that, every year since then, a different brother of the governing body was the chairman of the governing body. And the same principle is true with the six committees of the governing body. Uh, and uh, you know who the six committees are, and each one has a chairman, and the committees were set up to operate since uh, January 1976. Since that time, every year, a different brother was the chairman of each of the committees. And all this I should emphasize that we are all brothers, and Christ Jesus is our leader. And uh, it's a pleasure to serve with you, brothers, shoulder to shoulder. Shoulder. We are not masters over your face, uh, faith, but we are all co-servants uh, with you, serving for the Lord and for Jehovah God. Thank you. We have thoroughly enjoyed an abundance of spiritual provisions these past three days. 
And now the time has arrived for the concluding talk of this Remain Close to Jehovah District Convention. What is the secret place of the Most High Jehovah? Is it something we enter into at baptism? More important, what must we do to remain there? We welcome back to the podium Brother Moselle Mack from Patterson Bethel. We are eager to hear what he has to say in the talk, Remain in the Secret Place of the Most High. Brother Mack, please. High in the Alpine Mountains in Europe, you can find growing a sturdy bush called the Alpine Rose. The unrelenting winds of the Alpine Mountains threatens the very existence of all the Alpine plants. You see these strong, frigid, and troublesome winds lower the temperature of the plants, it dries out the air and their soil. The winds blow so hard that it actually pulls and uproots some of the plants. However, the alpine rose escapes the ravages of this wind. You see, the alpine rose, it grows hidden in the crevices among the rocks. The narrow openings in the rocks, they provide protection from the wind and all of its ravaging destruction. It allows the alpine rose to conserve its water because it's hidden from the winds. In fact, it could be said that the alpine rose survives because it's hidden in a secret place. You know, all of mankind needs protection from the harsh winds of this old world. Why the winds, the detriment, the trials and the tribulation that we all undergo, it robs us of our joy and our happiness. It zaps us of our zeal. In fact, the things that you go through on a daily basis, it makes you feel as though you're uprooted from your very faith in Jehovah. And yet, this convention program, it has moved all of us to reflect on our precious relationship with God. And I'm sure that these three days of instruction have helped all of us to feel much closer to Jehovah. But what about tomorrow? What about next week? What about next month? You see, eventually, we're going to have to leave this convention program. There's a possibility for us to be exposed to the harsh winds of this old world. Will we continue to strengthen and protect our relationship with Jehovah? We've had three days of facts and instruction. But what impression will you leave with? Yes, we teach facts. We hear a lot of facts and instruction. But what impression are you going to leave with today? Now, it's true, it brings about responsibility for all of us based on what we've heard. And usually when we're responsible for something that causes us to sigh, causes anxiety, we feel a load. But the good news is that Jehovah is going to help us. Jehovah is actually going to provide protection from the harsh winds of this world. Could you turn with me in your Bible to the 91st Psalm? And this is why it's such good news that we do not have to make it all on our own. In Psalm 91, this tells us of Jehovah's promise to protect us as his people. In Psalm 91, look at verse 1. Now, there the Bible tells us, Anyone dwelling in the secret place of the Most High will procure himself lodging under the very shadow of the Almighty One. 
Why, what a promise of protection. Did you see what the verse said? The Bible tells us that anyone that is dwelling in the secret place of the Most High will be protected. Well, what is the secret place? The secret place, obviously, is not where the Most High dwells. In fact, Jehovah needs no protection from the things that are mentioned here in the 91st Psalm. The secret place is a figurative place. Now, figurative just simply means it's something that represents something else. So the secret place is a place of spiritual protection that Jehovah has provided. It is a place that is concealed, and yet it has access for those that trust in Jehovah. This secret place is not something that has reference to only our physical protection. And usually when you think of protection, what do we always think of? We want to know, are we going to be protected physically? However, Satan, the devil, knows that if he just takes your life, as long as you die faithful to Jehovah, you're going to live again. The secret place has reference to spiritual protection. It's what allows us to keep our integrity to Jehovah. It's referred to as a secret because, you know, it's actually unknown to people who lack spiritual vision. It's unknown to those that do not trust God. But look at verse 1 again, Psalm 91. Did you notice that the verse said, anyone dwelling in the secret place? And the verse goes on to say, will procure himself lodging under the very shadow of the Almighty One. Well, we know to dwell means that's where you stay. You live there. And to procure, that's different than just simply to acquire. To procure means ownership. It means you have a right. So the Bible is actually telling us anyone who dwells in this place of spiritual protection you're there because you are a guest of Almighty God. And when someone is Almighty, well, you cannot be threatened. So you have a place where you will be protected spiritually by the Almighty One. Look at verse 4 of the 91st Psalm. You notice what the psalmist tells us? He helps us to appreciate that the idea is protection. Verse 4, speaking of Jehovah, likening him to a parent bird, verse 4 tells us, with his pinions, he will block approach to you. And under the wings, you will take refuge. His trueness will be like a large shield and bulwark. You notice the idea of protection? Number one, we know it refers to protection because it refers to the large wings of a parent bird. And with the bird's wings, it can easily protect its young. But the verse goes on to tell us something. Did you notice that verse 1 tells us, under the very shadow of the Almighty One? Usually, the shadow protects us from the burning heat of the sun. The idea is protection. However, some individuals, they're not sure whether they can be a part of this secret place. They're not really sure that they can actually be protected by Almighty God. And why don't we need protection? Brothers and sisters, you of all people know we need protection. You're out here on the front lines. You live among these people. You work with them. Don't ever think that the faithful and discreet slave is not aware of what you are undergoing. It's no wonder they've given us these three days of instruction, and now we're being reminded that we want to stay in this place of spiritual protection. You see, the winds of this old world, they can easily lower your temperature. Some have lost their zeal. 
The winds of this old world, it can zap you of all of your moisture. Some are no longer happy. They're losing their joy. Yes, they know God's name, but they're not happy. We need protection. Based on the trials and tribulations that you have to undergo on a daily basis, you feel as though your very fiber, your very belief in God is being uprooted. But like the Alpine Rose, Jehovah has provided a place of protection. You see, as the most high over all the earth, Jehovah can see everything. He can easily see approaching danger. And he can protect us from spiritual harm. So the place to be, the place to make your home, the place to make your permanent dwelling is the secret place of the Most High. But how does one come into the secret place? How does one enter in? Does it simply mean that once you're baptized, well, now you are in this secret place? No, baptism simply means that you just got started. It's simply a beginning. Turn to the 91st Psalm again, and this time let's look at verse 2. There, verse 2 explains how we enter the secret place of spiritual protection. Verse 2 tells us, I will say to Jehovah, you are my refuge and my stronghold, my God in whom I will trust. So it's not merely a matter of getting baptized. It's not merely a matter of knowing God's name. It's not merely a matter of associating with the organization that God is using today. When you can confidently say, as the psalmist, when you can say of Jehovah, you are my God in whom I will trust and mean it, that is, prove it by your actions, then you have arrived. You are in the secret place. So stop and think about this. Verse 2 is not saying, you will be my God. You're only in the secret place when you can confidently tell Jehovah, you are my God and whom I will trust. One Bible reference states it this way. I hang my heart upon you. When's the last time you demonstrated that to Jehovah? In your time of trial, when your back's against the wall, you have nowhere to turn. When's the last time you demonstrated to Jehovah? I hang my heart on you. Your heart is who you are. That's all of your dreams. That's your imaginations. That's your feelings. That's you, the real person. Do you tell Jehovah, you're my God in whom I trust? Ask yourself this question. Who do you turn to in time of trial? When you're undergoing some extremely difficult circumstances, who do you turn to? When you're at your wit's end, who do you pour your heart out to? Who do you hang your heart on? When you're in extreme need of comfort, where do you turn? When you have weighty and powerful decisions to make, who do you look to? You see, your answers to these questions reveals whether you are in the secret place. But can we really get help from Jehovah at a time like this? Can God really help us? Remember, the psalmist said, I will say to Jehovah, you are my God. He's not questioning. 
He's not doubting why the things that come out of our mouth sometimes. Is he able? Remember the Israelites said, is he able? How scary it is to sit there and wonder, can I really get help from God? How about chronic illness? There are many of us sitting out there right now. You're hurting and you're hurting bad. Chronic means it's constant. It's like all the time. Do you turn to Jehovah? Now, it's true, God does not cure us miraculously. But he gives us the fortitude. He gives us the strength to endure. As long as you are in the secret place of spiritual protection, now notice what Jehovah does. Turn with me there to the 41st Psalm and Psalm 41. And we need to read together verse 3. And Psalm 41 and verse 3, speaking of Jehovah, here's what the Bible tells us. Jehovah himself will sustain him upon a divan of illness. All his bed you will certainly change during his sickness. Chronic illness. Did you notice the Bible says Jehovah won't remove it, but he will sustain us. As long as you're in this place of spiritual protection, Jehovah will sustain you. He will be the one that allows you to continue. As long as you can say to Jehovah, you are my God in whom I will trust, you will not be eternally harmed. No matter how bad it hurts, he will never leave you. Now notice what Sharon said. Sharon said, for as long as I can recall, The wheelchair has been my constant companion. From birth on, cerebral palsy robbed me of childhood joys. Learning about Jehovah and his promises of perfect health gave me hope. Now, although she speaks and walks with difficulty, she finds joy in the Christian ministry. Some 15 years ago, she said, My health may continue to fail. But my trust in God and my relationship with him are my lifelines. How happy I am to be among Jehovah's people and to have his unfailing support. Now that's the secret place. She says, my health may continue to fail. She says, but she like the alpine rose. These winds of this system is not robbing her of her happiness, not robbing her of her joy. Let me tell you about Shelemiah. Now, Shelemiah suffers from a, a severe form of cerebral palsy. Shelemiah cannot walk. She cannot talk. Her motor skills have been severely impaired. And yet, Shelemiah... Through a special computer, she can talk with her parents there in the home. And you know what Shelemiah tells her parents? She talks to her parents about the new world. With a special computer and with air and just an elbow, she can operate the computer and communicate with her parents. She talks to them about living in the new world. Shelemiah talks about one day I'm going to run. She says, I'm going to have some pretty shoes. And she says, I'm going to have true friends. Chronic, but Shelemiah is in the secret place. Now, where are you at? Will you remain in the place of spiritual protection? How about those that are with us right now who have the unrealized hope of a marriage mate? You ever heard this before? And they got married and lived happily ever after. Oh, yes, we've heard it. Words like these bring many children's stories to a close. Romantic movies and novels often transmit a similar message. They transmit the message that marriage means happiness at last. Well, why are so many married people unhappy? Moreover, most cultures exert strong pressure on young adults to get married. 
They convey the idea that life only begins after marriage. Now consider the situation of a Christian who might like to marry, but who presently cannot find a suitable marriage mate. Here's an experience. Here's what Anna said. Recently, a workmate who was not a witness unexpectedly proposed to me. Now, Anna is a single sister in her mid-30s. Now, here's what she went on to report. She said, now, in a way, I felt flattered. She said, but I quickly suppressed that feeling because I want to marry only someone who will draw me closer to Jehovah. You see, Anna is in the secret place. She's telling Jehovah, I hang my heart on you. Many Christian brothers and sisters have discovered the positive side of singleness. Here's what Esther said. I think the secret to happiness is being able to enjoy the positive aspects of whatever situation you find yourself in. She too is in her mid-30s. She said, I believe that whether I get married or not, if I put kingdom interests first, Jehovah will not hold back anything good from me. And here's what Carmen said. My life may not have turned out exactly as I had planned. Carmen is still single. She says, but I am happy. And I will continue to be so. Why? They're trusting in God. They're putting Jehovah first. They're demonstrating by their life that they have arrived in the secret place of the Most High. And for many of us, we can cite circumstance after circumstance where all of us could come up and talk about our trust and our reliance in Jehovah. But could you turn with me to the 51st Psalm, please? In Psalm 51, in verse 17, because for many of us, this is what we must do. We must be willing to make changes and adjustments in our lives, in our viewpoint, in our outlook on things. In Psalm 51, look at verse 17. Now here's what the psalmist said. The sacrifices to God are a broken spirit. A heart broken and crushed, O oh God, you will not despise. Now it is true that the latter part of this verse does have reference to a heart that's broken and crushed. And many simply feel that this application has to do with a person that has sinned and now they're repentant and their heart is broken, their heart is crushed. But the first part of the verse tells us something. It says, the sacrifices to God are a broken spirit. We think of sacrifices. It's what, what we give to God, what we're willing to give, a broken spirit. This does not have reference to repentance. It has reference to our spirit, what drives us, the type of person that we are. And what God wants is for that spirit to be broken. That's how we get into the secret place. A broken spirit, well, it's like a cowboy. Now, I know we have a rodeo roundup room and things of that nature, but I'm not saying you're cowboys, but just bear with me. You see, a horse is made to run. A stallion wants to run and wants to run free. It does not want any cowboy on its back. And a cowboy has to get on that horse, and he has to ride that horse, he has to ride that horse, and that horse is trying to buck him off, he wants to throw him off, he has to ride that horse, and eventually, his spirit is broken. That's the sacrifice God wants. You can't stay the way you are. You have to be willing for your spirit to be broken. And then... You will demonstrate unfailing trust in Almighty God. Have you had unrealized hope of a privilege of service? Maybe you thought you were going to be a circuit overseer. You wanted to be an elder. 
It hasn't happened yet. Can you stay with God in the secret place? Maybe you were an elder and you lost your privilege of service. You were a big man in the circuit. Now you can barely raise your hand. But are you in the secret place? Maybe a beloved relative has left the truth and they left a hole in your heart. Maybe you're sitting there now wondering, where is my mate? All of this information we heard the last three days, I wish they were here to hear it. Maybe you're wondering about your children. You don't even know where your children are. You worked so hard, you worked your whole life. And now you don't know where your children are. Perhaps you lost your parent. Your parent has embarrassed the whole family. It was disciplined, no longer around. Will you trust in Jehovah? Will you tell Jehovah, come what may, I will remain in this secret place of spiritual protection. He's provided it for us. So brothers and sisters, allow nothing to cause you to leave the secret place of spiritual protection. Make this place your home. Now haven't you noticed that there is a big difference between a home and a hotel? Haven't you noticed that? Now they may tell you we'll leave the light on, but you can't move your furniture in. You can't move your favorite chair or your, your sofa or your icebox in. There is a big difference. You see, a hotel, you check in and you check out. You check in and you check out. But a home, that's where you dwell. You stay. Make the secret place your home. You see, if it's like a hotel, that means one day you trust in Jehovah, the next day you trust in yourself. One day you trust in Jehovah, the next day you're trusting in a talk show host or a judge, court judge or something. No. Remember, when you tell Jehovah, you are my God in whom I trust, then you know you're there. When it's your home, you know it because you consistently trust in Jehovah. Are we saying it's wrong to trust in others? Well, by no means. But during stormy times in our lives, Jehovah should be our main support at all times. We appreciate our beloved mates that help us. We appreciate our dear friends. We appreciate our caring parents and caring elders. But Jehovah is our main pillar of support. Now in any home, in any structure, any building or kingdom hall, there are different walls within that building. And you can move some of the walls and there's no damage to the structure. But then there are load-bearing walls. You can't move those walls. If you move a load-bearing wall, you've damaged the structure. We may have other walls in our lives. We may have other pillars of support. But Jehovah is our load-bearing wall. The Bible tells us that Jehovah will daily carry the load for us. So we must never leave. Regardless of what happens, we will always have our load-bearing wall. Only Jehovah can provide the protection that we need. Make him our main pillar of support. We may lose our maiden death. How disastrous. Feel like half of you is gone. Make Jehovah your load-bearing wall. You may feel as though you've been disowned by your unbelieving family members. You're lost. You don't know which way to go. Make Jehovah 
your load-bearing wall. Now, many times you may feel misunderstood. You ever felt that way? We're complicated people. Not everybody's going to understand you. No one understands as well as they would like to be understood. Have you noticed that? We all have problems. We have foibles. We have issues. No one's going no one's to understand everything. But Jehovah does. He may be the only one that understands you. Make Jehovah your main pillar of support. When your imperfections stand right before you, they seem more numerous than the hairs on your head. Make Jehovah your support. Make Jehovah your God and make him your comfort. Who but Jehovah could provide such personal protection that we all need? So allow nothing to cause you to leave this place of spiritual protection that Jehovah so lovingly has provided. Now, during a time of impending danger of a storm or hurricane, they usually give travel advisories. And many times the storm is going to be so bad, what do they tell you to do? They say, stay home. The greatest storm that has ever affected mankind is looming. The storm of Armageddon. Now is the time to stay home. Now is not the time to venture out to anywhere else. We must make the secret place of spiritual protection. We must make it our home and we must stay there. It's urgent that we recognize that. Now, recent clarification of a particular Bible verse tells us that we live deep in the time of the end. We're referring to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 34. Let's turn there because some in section 1 and 2, they're, right there, they're waiting to mark this. Some of them up there have even asked about this scripture. They're walking around in the corridors and people, are you from Bethel? Well, tell me about the generation. You see, the slave knows what's on your mind. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 34, let's look at that together. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 34, note the verse. Truly I say to you that this generation will by no means pass away until all these things occur. This generation. What is meant by that? It helps us to see that now is not the time to think about leaving the secret place. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 34 underscores that we are living deep in the time of the end. Now, it's true, for many years it was explained that those alive in 1914 would have to still be alive when the end comes. However, that explanation was adjusted in 1995, some 15 years ago. There it was said, the generation refers to the wicked people regardless of when they were born. It had reference to the mass of contemporary people who see the sign but ignore it. However, after further careful research, it has led to a clarification that was published in the February 15, 2008 issue of the Watchtower. And yes, this clarification was also reviewed in our Watchtower study just last month. This recent clarification has two key elements. One, people. Two, time. But which people? And at what time? Well, first, let's just simply explain what a generation is. A generation consists of individuals who live at the same time. Their lives may overlap, but basically they live at the same time. Does everybody understand that? A generation is simply individuals 
who live at the same time. Make note in your notes for your later study, but an example of this is found in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 6. Now that's Exodus chapter 1 and verse 6. There that verse refers to Joseph and all his brothers as all that generation. Now what's interesting is, ten of Joseph's brothers witnessed events that occurred before Joseph's birth. And at least two of his brothers lived on after the death of Joseph. But they all did live at the same time. Some experienced things before Joseph. Some experienced things after Joseph. But the Bible says they were all that generation. Although their ages varied, they were viewed as contemporaries and as one generation. So, what is a generation? People of varying ages whose lives overlap during a particular time. So the key element, the first one was people. So which people make up this generation? Is it the wicked? Let's go back to Matthew chapter 24. And note the key to the clarification is really in verse 33. Matthew chapter 24, look at verse 33. Now here's what the Bible tells us, verse 33. Likewise, also you, when you see all these things, know that he is near at the doors. Who is Jesus talking to when he says you? The earlier verses there in Matthew 24 make it plain that he's talking to his disciples. So Jesus' anointed followers would see the meaning of the sign, not the wicked. Evidently, the generation refers to the anointed followers of Jesus. So who are the people? The anointed followers of Jesus. Remember, there was a second key element. It was time. Now let's look at the time period. Again, the key is in verse 33. Let's turn there again. There the Bible tells us in verse 33, Likewise also you, when you see all these things, know that he is near at the doors. All these things help us to pinpoint the time period. Jesus is saying they would see all these things, which would include the tribulation that is mentioned in verse 21. So correspondingly, the generation referred to at Matthew 24, 34, comprises two groups of anointed Christians whose lives overlap and yet they share a common experience. All these things. So the first group, on hand in 1914 when the sign of Christ's presence began to be observed, and the second group, made up of those who were anointed later and for a time their lives overlapped with these older ones? That's the generation. Jesus' words at Matthew 24, 34 indicate that some in the second group will witness the beginning of the Great Tribulation. So not just some of the things, all these things, that's the common experience that groups them together, their lives overlap. Well, what is the point of all of this? Why would the slave want us to clearly have this in mind? If some of those of the generation would see the beginning of the Great Tribulation, that tells us that the time is short. Now, to put all of this in perspective, it might help to see a real-life example. Now, Frederick France was born in 1893. He was baptized in 1913, and thus he was alive to discern the sign in 1914. Since Brother France lived until 1992, that means many present-day anointed ones were contemporaries of his. Their lives overlap with him as anointed ones. 
and they're part of the generation that Jesus said would not pass away until all these things occur. So therefore, obviously, stay at home because the end is close. This is not the time to leave the secret place. Now, to help us to stay in this secret place of spiritual protection, we have many faithful examples. Anointed brothers and sisters in the past that were stalwarts in trusting in Jehovah. Why, one example is C.T. Russell. He remained in the secret place even after his close associate, N.H. Barber, rejected the ransom. A key teaching for Christianity. His associate said that, well, the ransom, it, the idea of the ransom is ridiculous. He said that, that there's no more value in the ransom than sticking a pin in the body of a fly and claiming that that will redeem our children. C.T. Russell, he remained in a secret place in spite of this. He held on to the idea of the ransom. He left Barbara. And there in 1879, he published the first watchtower. Aren't we happy he remained in the secret place? Another example, J.F. Rutherford. He stood for Bible truth despite opposition from inside and outside of the organization. There were four prominent members that served with him at Bethel. They wanted to have him removed as president of the Watchtower Society. They secretly tried to get rid of him. He withstood that pressure. And from the outside, remember, he was arrested, taken from Bethel. Imagine being taken from Bethel in handcuffs and put in a federal penitentiary. But Brother Rutherford, he held fast. He knew it was spiritual protection. And it is thrilling to learn how Jehovah backed these men, how Jehovah cared for these men, and how Jehovah protected them because they remained in the secret place of the Most High. In fact, we all need examples to look at because it helps us to know what we should do. Now, wouldn't it be thrilling if we could actually relive and see how Jehovah protected his faithful servants spiritually during that time period? Well, brothers and sisters, it is my pleasure to announce the release of a new provision that will help us to appreciate even more fully how Jehovah is watchful, loving, and cares for his people. It is a delightful new DVD entitled Jehovah's Witnesses, Faith in Action, Part 1, Out of Darkness. Let me show it to you. Now, your faith will be greatly strengthened as you consider the courage and the loyalty of these men, as well as how Jehovah has led them out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now, in addition to this release, there is an announcement that we would like to read. And the announcement reads like this. Last year... Conventions of Jehovah's Witnesses around the earth were thrilled to receive the new songbook, Sing to Jehovah. Many logged on to our website, www.jw.org, as soon as it was possible to listen to vocal renditions, Disc 1, which contains 17 of the new songs performed by a chorus and orchestra. At this time, we are delighted to announce that vocal renditions, Disc 2, is complete and contains 19 of our new songs. Starting September 1, 2010, you may begin requesting it through your congregation. And beginning September 13, 2010, this new audio recording will also be available to download from our website, www.jw.org. And currently, Sing to Jehovah Vocal Renditions Disc 1 is available on our website in over 15 languages. And this will soon be true of subsequent editions. In due course, vocal renditions of our entire songbook will be available in numerous languages on www.
www.jw.org. What do you think of that? We have another announcement. Today, there are over 300 million Buddhists worldwide. To, sell, to help such ones learn the truth about Jehovah, we are also pleased to announce the availability of a new 32-page brochure entitled The Pathway to Peace and Happiness. This brochure will not be distributed at the, this convention. Rather, anyone interested in reading or using this brochure may request it through their congregation in the usual way. What's your thoughts on that, friends? We need to mention that we want to make sure that we all avoid the counterfeit places of refuge. We have a place where we can find spiritual protection. It's the place that Jehovah has provided. And yet there are counterfeit places. You see, Satan, the devil, will stop at nothing to lure us out of this place of spiritual protection. And note this warning in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Let's turn there together. Here the Bible gives us a clear warning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We want to draw your attention to verse 2. And verse 3. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. For you yourselves know quite well that Jehovah's Day is coming exactly as a thief in the night. Whenever it is they say they are saying peace and security, then sudden destruction is to be instantly upon them, just as the pang of distress upon a pregnant woman, and they will by no means escape. Has this prophecy been fulfilled? The answer, no. None of the past efforts to bring about peace and security fit the description of this prophecy. Now, why not? Why can we say that? Because they were not followed by sudden destruction. Whether the cry of peace and security takes the form of some outstanding declaration or a series of declarations, the key for us to remember, it will be a facade. It will be a pretense. It is not what we're looking for. Stay at home. Stay in the place of spiritual protection. Work with God. Stay with the faithful slave. They love you dearly. They're praying long and they're praying hard in your behalf. You can tell from this program they know exactly what you're going through. Don't be shaken from your reason. Jehovah has provided exactly what we need to make it through this impending storm. What would you tell the 30 that were baptized yesterday? Would you tell them to remain in the secret place of the Most High? For those that symbolize their dedication, we want you to know we love you and we warmly encourage you to trust in Jehovah with all of your heart. We have another announcement that we are supposed to read. This is relatively new, but the governing body caught most of the convention, so they want it to be read at this one as well. On Thursday, June 10th, the European Court of Human Rights issued a landmark judgment in favor of our brothers in Russia in the case entitled Jehovah's Witnesses of Moscow vs. Russia. The court concluded that in denying the registration of Jehovah's Witnesses of Moscow, the Moscow authorities had not acted in good faith and had neglected their duty of neutrality and impartiality. Specifically, the court stated the charge that Jehovah's Witnesses forced family breakups was not borne out. Russian law does not provide for the offense of proselytism, and no evidence of improper methods of proselytizing was produced. The court was unable to find any indication that minors had been lured 
into the organization against their will, either by deception, trickery, or any other inappropriate means. It has not been persuasively shown that the community, that is, of Jehovah's Witnesses, or its individual members incited or were incited to refuse to carry out any lawfully established civil duties. The court's judgment also upheld the right of Jehovah's Witnesses to choose non-blood medical treatment. Time will tell whether Russian officials will respect this landmark court judgment. But regardless of what the Russian officials choose to do, we are mindful of King David's words, to Jehovah belongs the battle. What do you think about that, friend? We look to the future with confidence. We know Jehovah has provided us what we need. We have a place of spiritual protection. So we're going to continue to enjoy ourselves in this place. Next year, if it's Jehovah's will, we will have three-day district conventions in all parts of the world. And the governing body wants to know, are you determined to attend all three days? You know, brothers and sisters, there are a group of people that we do really need to thank. And some of our brothers and sisters, their families, They've been getting up at the crack of dawn. They've been working late behind the scenes. Don't we want to thank the many volunteers who worked so hard during this convention? Now, we also want to thank all of those who had a part on this fine program. Now, and not only the brothers who gave the part, not only their participants, but let's thank their families also, their wives, their children. We've been driving our family crazy. Yes. This convention program has moved us to reflect on our precious relationship with Jehovah. And there's no doubt we feel closer to him as our God. But remember, what about tomorrow? What about next week? What about next month? What about next year? Remember the winds of this old world, they put pressure on us. They're trying to lower our temperature. They don't want us to be zealous for the good news. It's trying to dry out our air and our soil, rob us of our happiness and our joy. The winds of this old world is pulling at our very roots. Our foundation in the truth. Will you remain in the secret place. You know, I forgot to tell you about that Alpine Rose, friends. You know, although the Alpine Rose is practically hidden from view much of the year, it's hidden in the cracks of the rocks and it is protected from the winds. You know, in the summertime, these plants, they come out. They decorate their mountain refuge with beautiful, bright, red flowers. You see, right now, we're in the wintertime. We're facing a cold and a harsh storm. But very soon, we will be ushered into the new world of righteousness. Very soon, we are going to be put into a paradise earth, and there we will blossom.
very soon, friends. If we can hold on a little bit longer, we're going to see our dead loved ones again. Look how you're going to blossom when you can see your parents again. You can see your children. Look how you'll blossom when you can be what Jehovah wants you to be. You're no longer plagued by your thoughts, your disquieting thoughts. Very soon, the wheelchairs and these walkers and these oxygen tanks, they'll be a thing of the past. Very soon, you'll no longer question your worthiness. You'll no longer wonder if Jehovah loves you. You will be in a new world. You will blossom. Nothing will come to your mind. The only thing you're going to remember. You know what you're going to say? I made it. I made it. Very soon, Shelemiah will be able to run. She'll have new shoes. She'll have close friends. We're going to live on earth in a time when everyone on the earth will be a close friend. Even a close friend of Shelemiah. We can get to know her because we remain in the secret place. Hmm.